and, and I guess my original thought was that it, theater worked kind of like the, the film studios used to, where you, if you wrote a spec screenplay, you got it to an agent who then sent it to a producer on the lot who then decided whether or not to make it. And unless you're William Goldman, you would have nothing to do with it. They would buy the rights um, and then they would ruin it. Hello and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces who are working to change the world. This episode is brought to you by Brain FM. Brain FM combines the best of music and neuroscience to help you relax, focus, meditate, and even sleep. I love it and have been using it to write, create, and do some of my deepest work. Because you're a listener of the show, you can get a free trial. Head over to brain.fm slash innovative mindset to check it out. If you decide to subscribe, you can get 20% off with the coupon code innovative mindset, all one word. And now let's get to the show. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg. I'm your host, and I want to thank you so much for being here. I am honored, thrilled, and excited, as always, uh, to be talking to this week's guest. You've heard me talk to him. You've heard me talk about him. You know what a big fangirl I am of Bill Fitzhugh. He is the award-winning author of many comic and satiric crime novels. His debut, Pest Control, was translated into half a dozen languages. The film rights sold to Warner Brothers. It was produced as a popular radio show in Germany and as a stage musical in Los Angeles. Prior to Human Resources, Fitzhugh published The Exterminators, the sequel to Pest Control. The New York Times said Fitzhugh is in a league with Carl Hyacin and Elmore Leonard. They are not wrong. He is a strange and deadly amalgam of screenwriter and comic novelist. The late great political humorist Molly Ivins said Fitzhugh is one seriously funny guy. A one-time FM rock DJ, he wrote, produced, and hosted Fitzhugh's all-hand mixed vinyl for five years on Sirius XM's Deep Track channel. Born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi, Fitzhugh lives in Los Angeles, where he's at work on his next project. And the most recent thing that I've read is fabulous. It's a play, and it's based on his latest book called A Perfect Harvest. Bill, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Hi, Zolda. Nice to be here. I'm so excited to talk to you about all of the things that you have going on. I know that all of your books have just been re-released by a new publisher. And I saw, you. will if you look at the show notes, if you look at the promo, you're going to see all the covers sitting behind Bill. Bill, tell me what happened there. What, what caused you to go, you know what, it's time to re-release everything. Uh, you know, it wasn't... I... <laughs> I was doing it on my own anyway, huh. as I got, as, as rights reverted on different titles. Um, and, you know, put them up on Amazon because it's something you can do where 25 years ago when I started doing this, that wasn't an option. If you went out of print, you went out of print mm. and people had to go to used bookstores and find you. And mm -hmm. then the internet came along and then you could find stuff on eBay, all physical books. But then Amazon gives uh, authors the chance to, you know, do print on demand uh, with their old titles or brand new stuff or whatever. But uh, <clears throat> I was I was sitting around minding my own business <laughs> and I got an email from a woman who worked for Duckworth Books in London saying that they uh, they, they, they specialize in humorous fiction and they wanted to uh, reprint any of my books that I had the rights for. So uh, we went back and forth and I had the rights to maybe half the books, most in the US, <coughs> excuse me. And um, uh, I don't think I had the rights back to anything that was published in the UK, but I, I sent letters to all the publishers and they said no, and I sent a stronger letter and they finally said, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> So I got all the rights in all territories to all my books and went back to Duckworth and they said, um, you know, that they wanted to uh, reprint everything. And uh, in, in, a, in a slightly different order, they wanted to organize it more than, than I had done as I wrote them. So they put uh, the, the two, Pest Control and uh, The Exterminators, they came out sequentially. 
and they had me write a short story called The Bug Job that introduced sort of the, the world of insects. It doesn't really, it doesn't involve uh, Bob and Klaus who are in the other two books, the Assassin Bug books, but it was, it, it would give, uh, and they just gave that out to their list. Mm -hmm. um, it would just give uh, their readers a sense of uh, what, what's this guy's writing like. And then they put the, um, the four, what, what, what we call the uh, uh, transplant tetralogy, uh, the uh, organ grinders, heart seizure, human resources, and a perfect harvest. All the uh, uh, organ transplant related books came out sequentially. And then the two Rick Shannon books uh, are coming out this month and next month. And then the other two sort of standalones, cross-dressing, is that right? Yeah, cross-dressing and uh, fender benders. Um, <coughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know if they're out yet or not. But anyway, um, and they said, they asked if I was writing anything new, which I wasn't. But of course, I said, sure. <laughs> of course I am. Always writing. And uh and at this point, I was developing the play, The Altruist. And it's, but it's, it, it's a story, you know, so there's play, plays are just a different way of telling a story than a novel or a film or a, a radio play, whatever. So um, I set about adapting the story for a novel because the play is pretty limited. It's like in the same way that I adapted pest control and cross-dressing and heart seizure, from screenplays that no one would buy, uh, turn them into novels, which changes the, the story sort of stays the same. They're, 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 you'd find out more stuff about the world that the character lives in because the novel gives you that opportunity. So uh, I uh, wrote the novel uh, or I pitched it and he said, oh, that sounds great. Wrote the novel in, in record time because working from a screenplay or a play, you've got everything worked out already. Mm. You know what the characters are like, you know what the whole story is, the beginning, the middle, the end. Oops. Dun, dun, dun. And that. the phone rang at just Leave the right me moment. Alone. Who calls the <laughs> line blown anymore? A um, telemarketer, of course. It was. It's, oh, uh, I, I, I get to do my, uh, my uh, uh, extended automobile warranty. Mm, yes, those are prolific right now. They're coming across yeah. every day or so. Yeah. Um, so uh, wrote the wrote the novel and they loved it. And so it's it's been published. But the, the way this all came about is it's a long it's got a long history and it, it sort of uh, goes to the the question that people ask writers a lot. So where do you get your ideas? And so. In 1995 or so, um, I was I wrote The Organ Grinders, the second book, and um, it's cr it's a crazy sci-fi sort of thing about the biotechnology, some 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 aspect of biotechnology, medical bi biotech, looking to find ways to transplant animal organs into people because the supply and demand situation, th there's a shortage of human organs. And if they could just figure out a way to, you know, transplant animal organs, there's money to be made. Mm. Um, and the problem is just in rejection. I mean, that's problem with human to human uh, transplants. Um, but an animal, you know, a, a, a different species introduced into the human body and the, the body's immune system attacks it. So they, they, you know, that's that's the big problem to solve. Which, of course, in my book, someone does. But they're mainly, I think, one of the main things that they've been working with are, are pig organs. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in organ grinders, I thought, well, you know, you probably have some fun with some pigs, but wouldn't uh, some sort of a primate be better? Uh, because first of all, it seems like the, the DNA is going to be closer there's less of a hurdle to overcome in the rejection um plus uh, you know it's an easier for uh and i and I, I didn't go with chimps because they're they're endangered and hard to get your hands on <clears throat> baboons on the other hand um uh you can you can work with those 
And so, whereas a pig, if, if you leave a shotgun lying around, a pig's not likely to be able to pick it up and do anything, but a baboon could. Right. So, of course, they do when, when given the opportunity. But sure. anyway, so I wrote this. So there's this crazy story about all these transgenic baboons on this giant farm in, in the piney woods of Mississippi. And um, I had, by this point, uh, become friends with uh, the playwright Leonard Gersh. Leonard Gersh wrote, among other things, most famous for writing Butterflies Are Free, mm, mm-hmm. a huge Broadway hit and a movie. Uh, and then he wrote a bunch of television stuff. He wrote uh, stuff with the Gershwins. Um, he was a great old school Hollywood kind of guy. And he read The Organ Grinders and sent me a funny note saying, oh, we should turn this into a musical. And you know, he wrote some funny jokes about it. And then he wrote some lyrics, which are actually a few of the lyrics in the first song in the play and in the book. Mm. So I thought, well, that's that's very funny. Yes, but I, I don't do stage. You know, so I just put the idea of, you know, it wasn't even an idea. It's like, that's just funny. And thanks for writing. Uh, years later, I read a a story in the newspaper about a guy in Georgia um, who was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. Mm. And he had the idea of donating all of his organs as his, you know, and and donate all of his organs, die on the operating table doing so, but saves eight people's lives. And he doesn't have to die of Lou Gehrig's disease. Seems like a great, and I thought that's a great story, but I couldn't see how to write it uh, as, as a comic novel. So I put the idea aside. And then I don't really know <coughs> how, you know, what happens, but it's like, hey, wait a minute. What if I put the, the two ideas together somehow? The idea of turning a crazy transplant story uh, into a musical. How would you do that? And the the result is The Altruist, um, which has gone through several drafts. I mean, in in earlier drafts, there were there were characters who were no longer there. You know, a cousin, an alleged distant cousin shows up um, and has this crazy story about how she's related. And she's there to, you know, offer, you know, whatever help she can. But oh, by the way, I need a kidney. Mm. And um, so but but, you know she got cut from the the next draft um so then i'm sending the i've never dealt with theater uh people before i mean i've got some friends who are artistic directors and and do stuff and i got some some information on so well you just send a query letter out you go to the websites you get a dramatist guild guide look for all the theaters see what they're looking for and then you know see if they're accepting submissions so i you know in the same way that I said about getting a literary agent 25 years ago, started, you know, made a list and started sending stuff out and mostly just didn't hear back from anybody. Mm. Uh, you know, most theaters are underfunded, understaffed. Um, some would get back and say, you know, this is not for us and that's fine. But thanks for getting back to me. You know, so my favorite rejection letter was we've already gone out of business. Oh, my. Yeah, well, it's theater, and they do that. And especially in the past two years with mm. the pandemic, sure. um, uh, lots of the, the, a lot of small theaters have gone under. Um, but so I, 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 I don't know, I've got 50, 60 rejection letters from around the country and, and the UK. Um, and then I, it sort of dawns, and I've been sending to some of the, the Los Angeles and San Diego uh, and Bay Area theaters. Again, no positive responses. And then I remembered, or it dawned on me, well, there's there are a lot of theaters in North Hollywood. It's what's called the NoHo Arts District here in the San Fernando Valley. And one where uh, Pest Control was produced as a musical. Um, look on YouTube for those videos. It's It was a pretty astounding show. In fact, if, I found out uh, recently it was, I think it's the most expensive show produced at a an equity waiver theater in los angeles ever wow yeah they've they put a lot of money and a lot of talent uh were, were in that 
but anyway, so so I knew there were a lot of these theaters in North Hollywood, and I you know found a list of them and <coughs> sent out my query letters, and quickly got a response from Doug Haverty at the group rep um, over on Burbank Avenue, <clears throat> and so uh, in my cover letter I'd mentioned pest control and all that, and he I think he was under the impression that I had written the musical, and I quickly you know. Uh, disabused him of that notion that, that no I just wrote the book somebody else wrote the musical and of course in in musicals there is something called a book so uh, you know like I wrote I didn't write the book for the musical I wrote the novel that they based it on okay that's fine still uh he read the altruist and invited me to join the group rep and uh it, which has been around for quite a long time 60, 70, 60 years or so, I think. Um, and so they develop you know, plays. So I, I would go in and, and they assign a bunch of actors and members come to the theater and the actors sit on stage with music stands in front and read the play. Very unrehearsed. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I got there an hour or two ahead of time to try to explain how the songs went. Uh, <laughs> but one of the reasons that I wrote it the way I did is, and, and uh, what I mean by that is that I used public domain melodies and, and not, there are plenty of obscure public domain songs, but I picked ones that I was familiar with and figured, well, if I know them, a lot of people know you know, Midnight Special, Will the Circle Be Unbroken, the Erie Canal song, all that kind of stuff. Bill Bailey, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, and in the original draft, it was all um, a cappella. Um, so, and, and, and this is not really a big spoiler. This is no more spoiler alert than the, um, the, the flap copy on the book is. The story is that a guy is diagnosed with not one, but two terminal diseases and uh, wants to um, uh, do what the guy in Georgia did. And since then, by the way, uh, since the guy in Georgia, uh, a few other people in the U.S. have tried to do the same thing, either af after being diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's or with multiple sclerosis, uh, and they've not uh, been allowed. I don't know that any, anyone has ever actually gone to court, but it seemed to me like that would be, you know, the thing to do to, for the story, you've got to, you know, uh, sue the state because the state of California gives you the right to donate your organs free from interference. Actually, it's a federal law, the United, um, uh, uh, I forget the name of the law, uh, but there, there's a federal law that if you are uh, an organ donor, if you've got the designation on your driver's license, if you have a donor card or whatever, you are guaranteed the right to donate your organs free from interference from anybody. Uh, and in California, at the time I was writing this, they were just passing the uh, uh, the Right to Die Act. Mm. Uh, so physician-assisted death, um, where uh, you have the absolute right free from interference from anybody to avail yourself of this right. Problem is the way they wrote the law is you have to do it not in a public place. A hospital is considered a public place. Mm. So you do it at home. By the time you get to the hospital, then your organs are not viable for transplant. Mm. So the way they've set the law up uh, for uh, AB 15, which is the name of the physician assisted death law, uh, the way they require you to do it interferes with your ability to donate your organs. So that's the basis of their lawsuit. We're gonna sue on uh, uh, the, the grounds that my equal protection is being violated. Um, and then they go they go get some publicity, the public finds out about it. You know, a lot of people are supporters. Some people are antag antagonistic towards this guy's request. And that gets the word out. And the next thing you know, there's a knock on the door and a music producer shows up saying he wants to turn this into an opera. So that's sort of the whole premise. And that's how we get to the songs. Um, and uh, I just, you know, started, I started with Leonard's lyrics 
when at work or at play, hear those organ grinders say, have you got any organs today? And I, I kept repeating it and I, I ended up finding that it worked with the melody for the Quezon song. Hmm. And the Quezon's go marching along. When at work or at play, hear the organ grinder say, have you got any organs today? So then I, I fleshed it out, wrote another chorus and a, uh, wrote a, another verse or two in a chorus. Um, and then I realized, oh, that, first of all, that was fun to write the song. Then I went, you know, found a bunch of melodies and then just started writing these goofy songs, you know, trying to find ways to, to uh, what rhymes with pancreas, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, we, we did the first reading at, at the group rep. I got some very good notes. Um, in fact, the, uh, the, the original draft that we read, there's, Leonard is not a narrator. Uh, he, he shows up only at the end of the first act. And somebody said, well, he just kind of comes out of the blue and, um, and sort of takes, uh, and draws a lot of attention away from Miguel, who's the guy who's dying. And I got a couple of the notes, but I thought, you know, that's a, yeah, what if, you know, he comes out as the narrator. Uh, and another thing was people weren't sure of the relationship of the other main characters. Mm -hmm. So, I, well, I can solve that easily. Leonard comes out at the very top, explains what, that he's there to tell a story about these people who are related in this way and, you know, enjoy the show. And then he comes back at the beginning of the next scene and says, I know you're disappointed I wasn't in that last one, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. Here's what, and, and then this happened. And then he, he keeps, you know, he does that for the first three scenes, I think. And he's not in the scenes. He just comes out and sets up the scene. And then in the late in the fifth scene, he, he's suddenly in the play. He's a character. He's no longer the narrator. And so I, I liked how that worked. So we went back um, for the next stage of development, which was a, um, a lightly rehearsed reading. And so, and, and the director who was assigned by the, the theater company is, is one of their musical guys, a guy named Bruce Kimmel, um, <laughs> who's been around Hollywood for a long time. I, I didn't know who he was. But if, if, if you look up uh, the first nudie musical uh, featuring, among other people, Cindy Williams, with whom he went to school, which explains why she's in this ridiculous movie. Um, <laughs> and, and if you, you know, or more specifically, if you just look up the dancing dildo song, um, you'll get a sense of, you know, who he is. Uh, so anyway, he's assigned <laughs> as the director and uh, he produces... Um, uh, uh, what do you call uh, uh, when uh, when people get up a uh, cabarets? He produces a cabaret show here in, in Los Angeles. Um, anyway, he de he decided we have to have music. We can't have everybody singing these songs a cappella. So one of the group members is a, a very good uh, piano player. Probably probably plays a lot of other instruments too. A guy named Paul Cady. Um, so he becomes part of the play, uh, providing the, the just piano. Um, uh, he's, he's the accompanist, mm. uh, but he's not in the play, at least in the draft that you read, he's not in there. Um, so Bruce simply had him off on the side of the stage and the, whatever character was about to sing a song would pause and say maestro and he would start playing. And so, and it added a lot to have just basic, you know, somebody playing the, the, the chords of the song to, to accompany the voices. Um, and uh, we, did, we did that in front of an audience uh, of, of, of uh, just group members, not to the public yet. And it was, it was great, very well received, hardly any notes of, on, you know, how you could, you know, what, what was wrong with it or anything. Um, and, but I, I still thought, man, it's a little bit long. I need, I need to cut, kill some darlings here. And I ended up cutting four or five pages 
from the draft that you read hmm. a lot of dialogue that was well that's cute but it's it doesn't get anything mm. it doesn't advance the character or the plot it's just a joke i thought was okay so i took it out and but uh now that i know that paul katie will be playing keyboards in the scene where leonard first shows up uh and they're trying to the Miguel's friends keep trying to throw Leonard out. And uh, he says, well, you haven't even heard the first number yet. Miguel says, yes, yes we'd, we'd love to hear it. And I, I wrote into the apartment that there's a, you know, electric keyboard somewhere. Like Miguel plays piano. And he says, look, I, I see you've got a piano. So, you know, let me just do the opening number. And they said, okay, fine. So he goes to the front door and reaches out and pulls somebody in who just kind of looks a little perplexed. Um, and they say, well, who the hell is that? He says, well, this is Maestro, my mute accompanist. <laughs> and, and he says, I'm not mute. And that's the only line he gets for the whole play. <laughs> <laughs> Other than playing the piano. From that point, he's just sitting over at the piano the whole time, uh, you know, providing, and, and every, they always turn over and say, Maestro, because that's his name. <laughs> So, I mean, those are some of the, 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 the few differences in the draft that uh, you have and the one that will go up. So the next stage is what they call a two-nighter, where uh, it's much more heavily rehearsed to the point that the actors are off book mm -hmm. and um, it's open to the public for two nights. Uh, and I that, that'll be sometime next year uh, because things are planned pretty far in advance in theater because um, it takes forever to get stuff, you know, get people rehearsed. And, you know, this is not like they're getting, uh, making a living wage doing this. It's, you know, LA is just full of people who are going on auditions for commercials, TV shows, movies, and they do theater in the meanwhile. Mm -hmm. So um, a bunch of really talented people, um, some of the cast was not quite right for the last version of it. So the, you know, a couple of the roles will be recast, but several were, you know, spot on. And I assume they will um, uh, get that job back. Um, but it's been great fun. So we'll do this, what's called the two-nighter, after which I guess the, the, uh, the artistic council or whatever it's called at the theater decides <laughs> whether or not to, turn it into a full-fledged production on the main stage for, you know, six weeks. But it's been great. It's been great fun. And, and I've just um, I've fallen in with these people uh, because there's a lot of, a lot of building, you know, building the sets and, and, and so forth. And I love building stuff. So I, I pack my tools up and go over there. And in fact, I was there this morning. I built a, a little staircase. It was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you're getting to have uh, a, a, such a big hand in being in, in, in having the show go up. It, you're not you didn't just write it and go, OK, off you go. You're involved, it sounds like, in a lot of different aspects of putting this production on. And congratulations, first of all, that, that this is this is your first hand really at this. And look at what you've accomplished. That's amazing. Well, it, it is. I mean, that, and I guess my original thought was that it, theater worked kind of like um, the, uh, the film studio is used to, where you, if you wrote a spec screenplay, you got it to an agent who then sent it to, you know, a producer on the lot who then decided whether or not to make it. And uh, you would, you, unless you're William Goldman, you would have nothing to do with it. They would buy the rights um, and then they would ruin it. Um, huh. but you know, but, but they, they would send checks, which, you know, you just, if you're playing the game, you know, that's how it goes and that's fine. So uh, when I was sending all these query letters out to theaters around the, co the country, mm -hmm. I thought, well, they'll, if somebody likes it, they'll take it on and, and they'll produce it, but I don't need to be there. Right. Cause they're, they're theater folk. They know what to do. So it, it's, um, uh, much more fun being hands-on. Hmm. And the, one of the reasons I, that I heard back so quickly from Doug Haverty 
uh, it turns out is that he had just become the artistic director at this theater. He'd been with the, with this group for a long time, but he had just become the artistic director and was reviving the writers unit. Mm. There, you know, there are a hundred actors um, and a bunch of people who direct, and then there are a bunch of tech people, the lighting and the sound people. Um, but the writing uh, unit had sort of gone neglected for a while. So um, now it's like last night I was there watching a, a rehearsed reading of a play called um, Surviving Frank Lloyd Wright by one of the members. And next week it's, um, what is next week? I don't know the title of next week's, but so um, Monday nights, there's a, a lightly rehearsed version of some members play on Saturday mornings, there is the sort of the first level reading of new plays. And, you know, anybody who's in the writer's unit or just an actor, anybody else um, is invited to be there and give feedback to the playwright. Mm. So, uh, and, and doing that is useful as a writer. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, m me watching someone else's play and seeing what I think works, what I think doesn't work, trying to articulate why it does or doesn't sort of helps you become a better writer yourself. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it is, but it's, I, I think I'm, I'm, uh, it's, I'm much better off being able to be there with the people who are doing it and learning the whole process. It's just, uh, plus, I get to use my power tools. <laughs> uh, it sounds like that's there's a certain amount of glory in that, too. I, You know, it's interesting listening to you talk about getting feedback from people. One of the things that struck me was that you're getting feedback in the moment from the actors, from the people who might be the set designers, from the director. You as the writer get to see from through all of these different lenses how your work might be improved from from their perspective uh, what does that do for you knowing that this is an actor saying this is this works this doesn't work this could be improved this needs some work or whatever versus the director is there a different flavor to that feedback and how does it change what you do with the play that you've written well i you know uh a note, a good note is a good note. It doesn't matter who gives it to you. If you recognize that, oh, yeah, don't give that information here, hide it until later and spring it on them here. It, it's a, it's a, it, it's a, a good note's a good note, no matter where it comes from, and a bad one too. And over, you know, the course of writing a dozen novels, um, I've gotten a lot of good notes and bad notes mm -hmm. and, and not, not that I, you know, I can always tell one from the other. Um, <laughs> but you just have a sense of, I don't see how that works, or I, I think that doesn't work because, and I've got a list of reasons versus that's a great idea. I'm, that'll change a few things downstream, but I can fix those, but it strengthens the character or it strengthens it, it gives you a good twist, it does something. And you just have to be able to evaluate um, whether it's good or not. But from from one of the technical things, the, the play originally, what I hoped was that, so uh, the first scene is at the doctor's office, the guy gets the diagnosis. Uh, then, oh, I, you know, I need a drink. Let's, so they go to the bar and in the bar, I had written originally that there would be, you know, half a dozen television screens showing sports, as usually happens in a bar. Mm -hmm. And in the course of the scene, without anybody ever commenting on it, the TVs, the, the, the screens would change from being basketball, for example, to the face of a person pretty close up, not really looking at the camera, but just sort of, you know, there and you know might scratch at their cheek they're just kind of looking around and at the bottom of the screen was a countdown clock counting down to zero and so 
one at a time, this, the, all the uh, televisions showing sports would turn into the face of a person with a countdown clock. And then through the rest of the play, the screens would always be somewhere. And one at, you know, periodically one would reach, the countdown clock would reach zero. Mm -hmm. And that person's eyes would close and the screen would go black. And then it would come back up with another person and a new clock. And then a different one later would go. Mm -hmm. And eventually you come to figure out, oh, these are the people who are dying because the lists for organs are too long mm -hmm. and people die while they're on the list. Right. So while there's all this zany stuff transpiring on stage, there's this serious thing going on, which I thought, oh, that's, it's very theatrical. I really like it, but talking to the tech, a technical person said, well, yeah, a couple of problems is, you know, the, the lights are facing towards the stage. The screens are facing towards the lights. They're not going to be easy to see. Right. Um, the, it's going to be impossible to really time the countdown clocks to a speed you know, a line of dialogue in the script. I can do that while I'm writing it. I can say, and at this point, right after this line, which is a perfect line for someone to die, um, that, you know, one of the screens goes black. But there's no way that they're, they're never going to read the play at the same pace two nights in a row. For sure. So uh, there were, you know, some technical aspects that made me think, yeah. I, and the other thing I it dawned on me was, and people might be now start looking at the clocks to see who's next. When is that one going to die? And what did, oh, I, I wasn't listening to what they said on stage. Right. I, I stopped paying attention. Right. So it may have been a little bit of you know, sensory overload. So that sort of feedback from the technical people made me drop all of that from the script. Sure. And it's, you know, that notion of pulling focus in, there's a lot of zaniness that goes on. We, having read the play, it's very zany. It's, it's hilarious and it's dark, macabre humor, and I love it. And yet there's a lot of really rich language that happens. Even, you know, even if Leonard is being a completely ridiculous person in the room, his, what he says has substance, what he says has meaning, and you want to be listening to what these people are saying and how they're coming to their realizations. So when you're writing this and you're writing the, 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 the book from the play or the play from the book, I'm confused about which went first again. I think the, the book came after the play, right? Uh, Correct. What, what was the difference? Like you said something earlier in this conversation that, you know, it's going to be very different, the play versus the book. And I, I have not read the book. I've just read the play. And what I'm wondering about is the play takes place in a relatively short period of time. How different is that from the book? And how, how was that adaptation with, you know, with the constraints of the play where it's, you know, dialogue and action versus a whole lot of exposition versus a whole lot of description? How was that un unfolding for you to go from the play to the book? Well, I, I've, I've done it three times. Mm -hmm. Best control, heart seizure, and oh, cross-dressing uh, were written as screenplays. Mm -hmm. um, and there's only so much information you can put in 120 pages and screenplays have limitations on types of information that you want to put in there. Um, but <laughs> they, they function beautifully as outlines mm. because you really, you get, you, you better have developed your characters to a, a good degree. Your plot is completely worked out. If you, you know, you, you, you've figured out what your second act problems are and, and <laughs> solved those or, or hidden them or done something. And then you can sort of expand. So in, in pest control, I couldn't really get into the science of, the assassin bugs, the biology of them. Mm -hmm. um, but in the book, I can go off and, you know, have a colorful paragraph about how the, um, the blood sucking cone nose does this. And if you cross it with the thread leg bug, it's who's got these traits, 
the hybrid is going to be this, you know, killing machine. Um, <clears throat> you you couldn't you wouldn't put all that stuff in in a in a script. You would you know he would there would be a, a quick scene in the lab where you see the insects, and you know one insect kills another one. And it, anyway, so um, for um, uh, perfect the, the altruist turning it into the perfect harvest. It's like in the altruist. All you know is that at the end, someone throws a bomb. You don't know who it is or why. In the book, we learn who the character is. I didn't know. I mean, I, I had to figure it out because, mm -hmm. you know, in the play, it, it doesn't matter who it is. It's just there are people outside protesting this guy, you know, trying to uh, have the state kill him essentially. Um, and one of them gets carried away and, you know, throws a bomb. So, but I, I didn't want, you know, I, I needed to have a, a character do that. And, uh, you know, who is that character? Why is that character doing it? Um, and it's one of the things that <clears throat> Leonard is the, because he's the narrator of the novel as well, which is the first time I've ever done that. I've never had a, a first person, um, uh, I've never written a novel in the first person. They've always been third omniscient. Um, and so while, you know, Leonard says, well, of course, I didn't know all of, you know, the things about what this guy was doing because I wasn't there. But the reason I can tell you about what he was doing before I knew him is that it all came out at the trial. So he's telling the story after you know, the whole thing has happened. Right. And the, the guy was arrested and we find out the, his whole backstory. But I, I told it sequentially. I didn't dump it on you at the very end. And so here's what we found out at the trial. <laughs> I, I write it, you know, as though it were third person, but it's Leonard telling us this story because he knows what, you know, what that guy was doing and, and how he got the bomb and so forth. Um, and there was other stuff about um, uh, if, if, you know, Leonard wants to get this play going in uh, Los Angeles, he's got to go talk to the theater people. Mm -hmm. And he goes to, he goes and meets with some old, you know, Broadway people who have moved out here. And he gets a lead to go to talk to this other person. And, oh, here's a potential money guy. And, you know, what we really need is um, if we could get a star attached, that would be great. And one th and and I had this in mind at one point with the with the play is I, I have a list of well known actors who have had organ transplants. Mm. And well, I you know see if they're interested in you know doing this as a play. And one of the um, actors is a woman who's in Modern Family. The um, I can't remember the character's name, but one of the sisters, one of the the, the daughters of. Um, do, do you watch Modern Family? Can you help me with these names? Uh, oh, what is it, uh, Lucy? So the real the, the real estate guy and his wife have two daughters and a son. Right. Uh, one of the daughters is the studious uh, academic type. One of them is a social media type. So that actress, the social media actress, um, has had two kidney transplants. Really? Yeah. I had no idea. Well, you know, you, if you look these things up, tr hoping to find somebody you can send a script to. So I thought, well, there, there it is right there. They're sitting at a... Uh, Miguel's in the car with Leonard at a stoplight and a bus pulls up with a big advertisement for a modern family like show. Uh -huh. It, you know, it's, it's wrapping up its 15th season. It's going to go off the air. And he says, Oh, you know, she's, she's really good. You know, she's had an, or she's had a kidney transplant. Oh my God. So Leonard immediately contacts her and we, you know, we get to meet her and her agency and how excited she is about doing this whole thing. So there's a, all that kind of stuff that's all very organic to the story, mm -hmm. um, but that there's no room for that in the play. Right. But in the course of, of the novel, um, it's there. Um, 
So, and, and there, there is a little overlap. I, I built in, in, uh, in uh, human resources, uh-huh. the, the, the third of the tetralogy. Um, there's uh, an underground transplant hospital in Los Angeles. And um, that comes into play in A Perfect Harvest. Uh, some of the same characters, um, there, there's some, some uh, cross-seeding of characters between the books. So I, want, I wanted to have some connection between the books, mm-hmm. the transplant books. Um, so, I, you know, there was, there was stuff that I could use uh, in, in this organ transplant world I've been writing about um, to flesh out stuff that uh, is true to the story of the play, but there was no room in the play for it. Right. It was essentially backstory for somebody, but in the novel, you're able to um, uh, bring it out uh, and, and uh, make that part of the actual story. And it's so interesting to me that you say that, that, you know, there is no room and I can use it in the novel. And then to make things even more, uh, I guess big is the word that comes to mind. You're, you're, you're peppering things among all the novels that will relate one to the other. And I think that enriches the world that you've built. And I wonder when you're doing that. Oh, and by the way, Sarah Highland is her name. I just wanted Thank to. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I thought of it and I went, oh, let me, I wanted to say <laughs> that. Uh, you know, so when you're doing that, when you're thinking about the the plot of the book or the plot of the play, how much of that is I'm gonna I'm going to make it vast and make it bigger than just the one book, make it bigger than just the one play? How much thought do you give to that, or is that something that happens during the process of you writing it? I was during the process. It was not. Uh, there was no pre planning. Mm. I wrote the organ grinders in ninety five based on the newspaper article about xenografting um and i thought it was a a stand it was a standalone book and then in the course of writing the organ grinders and learning about how organs are distributed and 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 some other stuff it's like oh here's here's this other story idea i mean it's a it's got nothing to do with this one but i found out because of doing all the transplant research Mm. here's this other story and that became heart seizure in the course of which I thought about, well, what if you, know, you could do this and this and this, and that's a great story. And that became um, uh, um, human resources. Right. And then, so, but, you know, I, I, while I guess I could have tried to bring in characters from the other, the, from heart seizure or organ grinders into uh, human resources. I didn't. Mm-hmm. But when I was doing the the altruist, I I, I finally well I, l- let's try to you know connect some dots because uh, organ grinders is in mostly in the Bay Area and in Mississippi where this baboon farm is. Mm-hmm. Um, heart seizure was in L.A. So I mean, yeah. So I could have included some of those people, but I didn't. Uh, and then the next two are, are also set in Los Angeles. So I finally figured out, oh, I can, you know, cross populate uh, characters from previous books into the new book and people can, you know, can recognize mm-hmm. those things. Um, oh, I, I will say this. <coughs> uh, so I, when I took the or first submitted the altruist to the group rep, um, it's pre pandemic. And uh, so we were starting to do that first read and then Doug Haverty's gave what, uh, what's called a, a writer's prompt to all the, to anybody in the group who wanted to do it, said, we're going to do a, um, a short play festival. The set will be the courtyard of a motel somewhere on route 66, two motel doors, four characters, max, huh. 10 minutes. And so I came up with a play that I wrote and that they ended up producing. So I've, um, they're, they, they got, a, I don't know how many submissions they got, but they selected 12. And um, 
built a stage outside in the parking lot next to the theater Mm -hmm. with, you know, full lighting and sound and everything else because you couldn't be inside because of COVID. Um, And so uh, that play, uh, my play is called um, Last Exit for Lodging. Also, you can find that on YouTube. Awesome. But it's a good, you know, 10, 12 minute play. And um, and it was just, it was, it was great fun because it's, it's having that prompt. It's like, okay, I've got to work with that. And I quickly had this idea uh, and it, you know, it needed several drafts to get it to where it ends up. But um, that was great fun. And then you get to see people up there uh, getting your line drawn and they drive you crazy. <laughs> ah, I imagine, you know, it, it, here's something that's I this what you did, you know, the constraints of it's got to be 10 minutes long. Here's the prompt. This is what it's where it's going to be. How do you feel about that? Do you what does that do for you as a writer? Do you prefer it or do you prefer to let your imagination run wild? Well, when, when, in this example, I loved it because I quickly had an idea that I thought was great. Mm. Uh, and that, um, a lot, you know, I, I think it was one of the, uh, I think it was one of the better received plays of the 12 that were produced. Um, it was just, it, first of all, it, it saved me some time. I didn't have to think of, oh, I could set a short play in a, courtyard of a motel somewhere on route 66 to you know given certain restraints okay what can i do with that it's it's like opening the refrigerator it's like okay what can i make what are the ingredients that i've got to work with so i don't have to go to the store and say well four actors two doors motel okay and and the the range of, of plays that people came up with were, it was great. There were a couple of ghost stories. There was, you know, a, there were some uh, some cheating spouses because that's what cheap motels are for. Um, and there were a couple that were sort of otherworldly, um, so that the motel's not exactly what you think it is. Mm. And uh, so that that's uh, I thought it was great. I, I wouldn't want to, you know have to sit around and wait for somebody to come tell me here's how here here's your prompt right now go write because you don't i i could have just not written anything there's right. no, no requirements mm-hmm. <laughs> right uh, absolutely it's you know when i when i work with uh my writing students for example I do a lot of work with prompts and usually they're like a, a location an object and a profession and they have 10 minutes to write a story incorporating those three things or any one of those three things. And personally, I find that having that gives me, uh, it's almost like a crucible, right? That, that I can, knowing what my constraints are, I can work anywhere within that. And so that brings me to a question for you. What do you do, if anything, and I'm not sure if this is even a question that's okay to answer or to ask, (laughs) but, but, what do you do to, I feel weird asking a professional writer this, but what do you do to improve your writing? How do you work to do that? Or do you feel like it's just part of the process and, and you're in the flow? Uh, you just keep writing. Um, I mean, I, there's no doubt that I write better now than I did writing my first book. And by which point I had written a lot of stuff. I you know started off in radio and I'd write a thirty second commercial or a sixty second commercial and then I started writing a radio comedy show, where it's you know one minute, two minute, five minute sketches, and then started writing sitcoms, which are you know thirty page scripts, and then screenplays which are one hundred and twenty pages. And it's sort of coincidentally that I did this. I mean, some people just start off by trying to write a novel. Mm-hmm. or a screenplay, or a short story. Uh, I just, as it happened, started <laughs> writing these 30-second things, these commercials, mm-hmm. and ke- just kept ending up writing longer and longer form things. And as you do that, um, provided you, you, know, you, you take feedback and, and you're reading other people's stuff, 
and you're seeing where yours does not hold up to the people whose writing you admire, you can try to figure out why and then try to, um, you, know, you, you just look, because it's, it's, a, it's one sentence at a time. And then you write it, and it's like, no, that word needs to be at the end of the sentence. And uh, you recast the sentence. And you keep doing that with every sentence. And then does the paragraph work? Does this section of the book work? And so forth. And, you know, you if um, if you do it long enough and, and, you, uh, and you're aware of, you know, um, you know, just uh, you just if you're just aware, you can just tell. Oh, that's that's terrible. <laughs> and, and and I know what I'm trying to do, but I'm not doing it. Mm. And then you try to figure out why. And you can either try to you know rewrite that thing, you wrestle it in the third. No, just throw that out and try again. And you just got to be willing to do all that. Mm. And it it takes time and. I was thinking when you said you, you give your students a prompt and then you give them 10 minutes to write a story. It's like, that's terrible. You can't <laughs> do anything in 10 minutes. I can't think of an idea sometimes in 10 minutes, not even a bad idea. <laughs> and, I, and I took a class at UCLA Extension uh, once after I had written my first book, but I wanted to keep, you know, exposing myself to uh, people who were teaching uh, and other writers and, you know, cause you can always, you can always learn something. Mm -hmm. And, but one of the things was okay. And she gave a prompt and said, now, you know, you know, quick, write the story. And I, I just sat there for a minute and kind of, no, I, 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 it's like <laughs> telling a dog to sit. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not trained. I'm not a trained little monkey. Uh, <laughs> And, and the main thing probably is that nothing dawned on me in the short period of time that I had. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I probably would have tried to write something. But I hope your your students know, and I'm sure you tell them, that whatever you come up with in the course of 10 minutes is not a final draft. Oh, of course not. No, no, no. That's that's not what this is about. What what it's about is is to open up their sort of creative brain and start thinking about what they could write about. You don't have to have anything done. In fact, yeah. what you have to have is the uh, the time that 10 minutes to imagine if what right. can you do? What might I talk about? What might this be? And and that's that's what the that's what these exercises are designed to do. And I do the same thing with the writers group I run. And we've all started actually after a few months of doing this, we're all actually writing stories that have a beginning, a middle, and an end in ten right. minutes. And and so I you know I think writers write differently. Some some write every day, some write over a weekend, some whatever it is, when you're in that space, when you're in the writing space, like you said, now I can't, I'm not a trained monkey. So what, what does it, what do you need in order to feel like you are uh, writing and creating at your peak? Um, well, a lot of writing is thinking about what you're going to write. Mm. And so I know, if I know, you know, I've, I've got, you know, uh, the, the, this woman is, is, is reaching the top of the list to get a heart. Um, and she's been on the waiting list for so long because she's got a rare blood type and then a heart becomes available. Well, what if somebody powerful wanted that heart? Mm. Uh, it could be a mob guy. It could be, eh, what if it's the president? Um, so yeah, the president's going to come in and steal the heart. Well, the, the guy whose mother is supposed to get the heart takes exception to that. And off we go. He steals the heart and the government's chasing him. And then the government's, the, the, the president's political opponent is chasing those people. And um, so, and, and you can't write, it all in a day, sure. a novel. So you just, you're always thinking about, okay, then what happens? Then what happens? And, and you make, I'm making notes about a rough idea of the scene where the FBI guy and the CIA guy, you know, confront one another, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, or, uh, 
it's like that. So I, I in, in heart seizure, that's the plot that I've been sort of mm -hmm. talking about here. The, the, the this guy has stolen the heart back. That's his mom's supposed to get, and he's on the run. Uh, the, the beautiful plastics, uh, uh, heart surgeon has gave chase, um, and ends up jumping in the back of his pickup truck, uh, um, and then falls down when he takes a sharp turn. So she's unconscious now in the bed of his pickup truck. And so he's <laughs> racing away from the hospital. Um, uh, and then, you know, all, uh, be on the lookout goes out and the cop pulls the car over. Well, in the first draft, uh, the cop, you know, mirrored sunglasses, you know, just staring at the guy, staring at the unconscious woman in the back of the truck, back at the guy what's going on here. And the guy just sort of fast talks his way out of the problem and gets away. And well, okay, that's, that's one way you can do it, but eh, it's just kind of lying there. Mm. And it seems like there's a, something better can happen. So I went back and took another shot at it. So the, the cop pulls him over, sees the, uh, the woman and goes for, goes for it. And then the radio crackles, be on the lookout for this pickup truck with the plane. You know, and so he goes for his gun, the cop does, and he fumbles it like Barney Fife, and it lands on the ground between him and the guy. And the, the narrator has explained this is the first time the cop has ever drawn his gun on the job, and now the gun's on the ground, and uh, the, 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 the son of the woman grabs the cop's gun and points it at the cop, who throws his hands up in the air and says, don't shoot me, I'm gay. Oh my God, I can't believe how long it's, I've, I've been wanting to tell somebody for so long. So the guy comes out, it has nothing to do with anything, but it's like, that's much funnier mm -hmm. than he talks his way out of trouble and he, and he drives off. So, but now he has to kidnap the cop. Right. So he does. And I thought, well, there's an idea because previously in this story, this, what, what I'm about to describe doesn't happen in the course of things people keep finding out about this guy with this heart and this surgeon and now a cop. And when they, when somebody recognizes them, they have to kidnap those people too. <laughs> so, so it's somebody in a Winnebago. So great. Now we're in a Winnebago and then it's a, a busload of a Mormon basketball team. And so now, you know, they're now driving a school bus and they've got Mormon basketball team and they got the people in the Winnebago. <laughs> so it just, it's just like, well, that's, that's just kind of funny. Yeah, so, and it's a snowball rolling way downhill. Yeah, you know, and, and, and some of them can, and I don't, I, it's been so long since I wrote that one, you know, some, some of them could then try to sabotage, some could uh, try to do things that, you know, help them when they get in a tight spot. So it's just being open to, well, like you said, you know, well, then what might, what, what could possibly happen next? Right especially once Murphy gets in the mix and everything goes wrong. And that's yeah. part of it. You know, it's going to be challenges that your, that your characters have to <laughs> overcome. And that's, the, and that's the, the better way to do it. I was, I was, I was at the Jackson Hole Writers Conference critiquing some, some work and trying to, you know, and somebody had a story that, you know, everything kind of went okay for the protagonist. It's like, well, you know, so, eh, if you've got somebody in a rowboat, it's going to go from this side of the lake to that side of the lake. If they just row across the lake, that's dull. But if a storm comes up, if the motor dies, if the boat starts to leak, you know, if there are piranhas in the, you know, I mean, <laughs> find something that makes it, you know, a challenge sure. for the person. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, I love that you put it that way because it is, uh, as, as writers, we just writing about, oh, I wrote my, that's, that's fair. That's nice. But it's certainly not going to make for amazing storytelling if, if there isn't some kind of conflict or obstacle that, that your character has to overcome. And in, in your work, what's, what I've noticed about reading your work, Bill, is that your characters have half a breath before the next obstacle shows up, you know, not even that. They might not even have half a breath, and then all of a sudden there's a bus careening towards them. And and I love that, but it's also, I, I, I laugh a lot when I read your work, 
And at the same time, I cringe that I'm laughing at some of the macabre things that I'm laughing at. And I'm wondering when you're when you're writing these, uh, what 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 takes precedence? Is it what is uh, what's going to be funny, or is it the conflict, or how do they lay one on top of the other? Yeah, you know that's the, you play that by ear, and then you go back and look at it, and it's like, well, that's cute, but. It took an awful <laughs> long time to get to the punchline. It has not developed the char- any character at all. It's not mm. moved the plot forward. It's just sort of like, oh, here's a joke. Right. And it's like, yeah, I, I, I'm sure I, I leave more in than I should. But I do go back and say, you know, is that, is it anything other than funny? If, if it's advancing plot or character or something and it's funny, it's got a good chance that it'll stay. Mm. Um, if it's just funny, it better be really funny. Um, I, I, back to something you said earlier about, you know, about getting improving in, in writing when Farago books, which is the publisher reissuing all the titles um, asked if I you know wanted to do that. I said, yes, if you'll let me re-edit the organ grinders. <clears throat> and they said, oh, sure, why not? So I took out 20,000 words. Wow. Um, I think the original was 120, which is way longer than the story needed to be. Hmm. Uh, the acquiring editor originally uh, got the book and then was promoted, handed it to a second editor who promptly left for the advertising business who handed it to a third editor who must have thought, well, two editors have already worked on this. It, I, I don't, you know, I, I won't give him any notes. Oh. And this is book number two. When mm. I, you know, and, and it's like, no, it really needed editing. Um, so that's the one I, I went back and completely, I rearranged some, what parts of the story got told when, um, and, I had this impossibly and unnecessarily complicated motive, sort of a dual motive for the main character's actions. And it's like, no, simple. This, you know, he, he blames this guy for his father's death. Nice and easy. Nothing original, but, you know, it's it's a motive. And I, you don't have to go on for pages and pages explaining this more complicated idea that I had. Um, and the book's much better for being 20,000 words lighter. I, I'm i going to believe you, except for that it is my favorite of your books. So <laughs> now I'm going to have to go back and reread it and see what's different. Uh, yeah, because because that story has so there's so I know you you've said, oh, it's a little it's a little convoluted. I had a, I had to cut things and that this is sort of the writer's remix, if you will. Yeah. And, and and yet I, I'm like, wait, I, what got cut? You know, because I, I love the story and I don't mind at all the extra 20,000 words. So I'm very curious to see what you what you decided to do differently. And, and when you're doing that, when you go back and you revisit these old friends, if you will, do you see that with the other books too, that you want to change things? Or was the organ grinders one of the ones that, that really sort of set in that you wanted to make some changes? Well, I, I think what happened is Pest Control um, uh, was, first of all, it was based on the screenplay. So it had a lot of the problems worked out. The right, the plot, the characters, mm-hmm. the stuff was all, you know, nice and neat in the screenplay. And then the research on, into insects was, was uh, fun, fascinating, um, and uh, uh, really f- helped flesh things out. But the, the structure was, was very good on that one because it had been structured as a screenplay. Mm-hmm. Organ Grinders was my first time to try to write some, a novel from scratch. And while I had some sense of what the story was and first, you know, what sort of the three act structure, which is more of a screenplay thing, really. But, um, I, you know, I knew who's going to live and die and, and why. 
um, it was it was just sloppy. And and I I think I was um, I was nervous that oh it's not going to be long enough. So I'm going to you know go on and on and on about mm. in that the opening chapter of the version of Borgen Granders that you read is uh, Bob is a kid going to meet this powerful businessman uh, who he thinks is going to help him you know save the planet. Um, but it just goes on forever. <laughs> it's like not that the sentences are poorly constructed or anything, but it's like nothing's going on. So now, you know, the, the now this starts with uh, a scene at the baboon farm, mm. which is later in in the version that you were. It's like so now it opens up with what in the world is going on at this secretive facility in the piney woods of Mississippi involving gigantic chakma baboons i'm interested you know it, it just seemed like a, a more interesting way to start mm -hmm. and then uh anyway so um uh the third book was cross-dressing based on the screenplay so the plot was already worked out the characters were already worked out um and i wouldn't by that point was getting a sense of how much or you know it took to reach 90,000, 100,000 words, which is the general length that the publishers were looking for novels at the time, mm -hmm. which which is, you know, not a great, you know, thing, because if a story takes 80,000 words to tell well, 100,000, telling it in 100,000 words, not helping it. Right. Um, it, the story should be the length that it needs to be to tell the story, not to meet the contractual obligation right of word count um so but so two of the first three were based on screenplays and they were better structured because they had been pre-structured by virtue of being screenplays uh, fender benders i think i had just gotten better uh so that was an original idea um and i kind of knew what i was doing more by then uh and there but th at that point there's no going back then I've got a four book deal. I need to keep working on the next one. And they're not going to go back and re-edit and reissue book number two. Uh, that's just an opportunity that is available um, now, either um, through going through, you know, Amazon create space or something like that. Or in this case, a publisher says, you know, we want to reissue it. And if you want to re-edit that, great, let's do it. So that's, uh, that's how that worked out. Wow. Yeah, I you know, it's fascinating to me that you found yourself in a position to edit the one book that you would like to change and and come to it with the sensibility of who you are today versus 25 years ago when you wrote it. What about now? What about the work that you're doing now? I know that you have a new short story in an anthology and I love the anthology's name it's a bag of dicks I'd love it if you talk a minute about what what your writing is like now in this short story and also a little bit about the anthology and where we who love your writing can get the anthology sure um so periodically um just because you know uh crime writers and, and I'm sure this is true in other genres as well um somebody will decide they want to um, edit an anthology and they'll uh, like Jim Fusilli my friend Jim Fusilli who was the pop rock critic for the Wall Street Journal for years he's also a, a crime fiction writer um, uh, got a deal for a book um, uh, it was called Crime and Music and so he came to me because he knows how much I love music I was in FM DJ for a while um, and so wrote a story for that. Um, in this instance, a guy named Colin Conway, who was an ex uh, Spokane uh, police department. He was a cop in Spokane, um, but has become a, a, a crime writer, um, has what's called the 509 series. 509, I'm pretty sure is the area code for Spokane. And so all of his crimes take place in this world that he's been writing about. And he reached out to um, a dozen people. Uh, and I, he and I had never met. I think uh, an acquaintance, a mutual acquaintance, uh, suggested that Colin might, you know, 
ask if I wanted to write a short story. <coughs> um, and it's, so the, the most anthologies like Jim Fusilli's were just to have music somehow involved in the story. Um, and and the, everything is completely unrelated story to story to story in that collection. In this one, Colin starts off with um, one of his regular characters, a detective, um, at the hamburger joint called Dick's, which is, there's, there's, one, uh, there's one in Spokane, there are a couple in Seattle, but I think they're actually unrelated, even though they're, hmm. their marketing all looks the same to me. And I lived in Seattle, I, I used to, and they're, they're cheap, cheap hamburger stand hamburgers, mm -hmm. um, but that's the bag of Dick's. Which is just, I was like, oh, I wish I had thought of that. <laughs> <It's just funny. laughs> anyway, so he starts off with a character, his, one of his detectives um, at Dick's Hamburgers, and he sees a guy running off with a, a bag, but the, something about the way he's running off just makes the cop think there's something going on there. And he, he sees, a, you know, one of, uh, you know, some junkie guy that he knows by virtue of being a cop. And he calls him over and says, you know, did you see that guy running off? Uh, I want what's in that bag. And if you find it and you bring it to me, you get a get out of jail free card. Ooh. And the guy sort of negotiates um, to, to get, you know, what if I find two bags? You know, uh, the cop says, whatever, you know, just but, you know, bring back the bag. And so then um, Colin's idea to all the writers was now you somehow find a way to get word that this detective is offering a get out of jail free card. If you bring back a, a Dick's hamburger bag with some you know element of a crime in it. Mm -hmm. And so, and everybody, and there were a few things that you couldn't do. Um, but he mostly didn't have a lot of rules other than it, it ends up, it has to take place in a certain period of time because at the end of the book, he will wrap up the story. Um, he, he will explain, you know, what happens, you know, with this detective, because I, I don't, yeah, I couldn't write about his detective. So in, in my story, it's a guy who has um, uh, just come out of his second to last uh, meeting with his parole officer. Uh, and he's on, he goes over to, to a friend's house and says, you know, I, I just got back from, you know, meeting with the parole officer. But before that, I ran into so-and-so who, you know, and then he says, and there's this cop who's looking for, you know, whatever this guy was running away with. And if you just bring it, you know, it's a get out of jail free car. Mm. So the two of them, it's like, well, you know, where are we, this, this was two hours ago. The guy, you know, it, it probably just a bag of dope and he's shooting it up right now. I said, yeah, but the cop doesn't know what's in there. So it can, you know, we can just, you know, go do, you know, find a, a gun, steal a gun from somebody, put it in there and turn it into the cops. If it turns out it's, you know, related to some crime, you know, we get a jail out, get out of jail free card. <laughs> so, um, and I've only read one story so far in the anthology. I just got my copy of it. Um, I just read the first story. It's like, Wow, that's that's it's a really good story, um, and mine, of course, is you know these is a couple of knuckleheads, um, and uh, things you know go badly for them. But it's 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 sort of like uh, the old game of you know a bunch of people sitting around in a circle. One person whispers to the person to their right a, a, the beginning of a story, a story, and mm -hmm. then they have to retell it to the next person. And they retell it. And by the time it gets around, the story is completely different. Sure. It's like the telephone so, game. Telephone game. Um, and so uh, that's, the, so that's the, the idea of the anthology is that the stories are each independent, but they were all triggered by that first event. Mm -hmm. And then, and I have, I can't wait to, you know, see how, what Colin does to wrap it all up. I mean, I guess he's free to, you know, use any of the characters created by anybody else in any other story. I don't know that he had a, 
uh, I don't think he had his story written beforehand. I should ask him. I'm just curious now that I think about it. But anyway, that's a, it's uh, called A Bag of Dicks, and I'm sure it's on Amazon and anywhere else you can find your uh, electronic or your physical books. Awesome. I'm, I'm excited to read it. It's, uh, it sounds a little bit like Exquisite Corpse, too, you know, where you have where you continue each other's stories, although this may not be right. a continuation of each of each writers. It's just everybody's different take on what could be in that in that bag. I love it. What a great idea. It's uh, it makes me think of the suitcase in Pulp Fiction, you know, that briefcase. Anything right. could be in that right. briefcase. Yeah. And it doesn't <laughs> matter. It doesn't matter what's in there. It's just the MacGuffin. Exactly. And it's and and it lets you in it lets you it gives you the in into the world you're going to create, which I absolutely adore. Yeah. Bill, I could keep you here for the next six hours, <laughs> but I know you have a life to get back to. I'm, I was lo- I would love to ask you a couple more questions, if that's OK. Sure. Uh, first, before I do anything else, thank you so much for coming back on the show and I'm going to put the link to your first to our first conversation in the show notes for this one because we didn't touch too much on the same topics. So I'm excited to to share both of those things with if you're listening. You of course know you need to go get Bill's all of Bill's books and read them right now. You know that the reissues, uh, the reissued organ grinders. It's much better. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm gonna do it right after we get off this call. I'll send you a copy. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. Uh, I would appreciate that so much because uh, I, I'm doing a lot of traveling right now, and that would be the perfect thing to read. And and the other thing, uh, what what is what is next for you? What what is the next project? If you want to tease anything, I would love to have a little scoop. Um, well, I, I just got another uh, uh, short story invitation, um, and I've just got uh, no idea. Let me see. Hang on. There it is. Uh, Private Dicks and Disco Balls. <laughs> oh, that's so right. There's, there's a theme developing here. Um, you got a Michael Bracken uh, who has edited several crime anthologies. Um, asked, you know, if I wanted to contribute a short story here, which is set in the 70s. Um, and I, you know, so as it turned out, I, I worked in, after working in radio, I worked in nightclubs mm. uh, during the disco era. Oh, boy. And then later during the video era. So both in the 70s and in the 80s, mm-hmm. did I spend time um, watching people uh, do what they do at nightclubs. Um, <laughs> oh, the details of that are... I've just got to figure out a story. Uh, you know, I, I, certainly a lot of goofy things, strange things happen. Oh, for and, sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but that's, you know, so that's, that won't be out until, you know, uh, it's a year out, I'm sure. And I'm really focused on, uh, I've done the the rewrite on the play. Um, and I, and I do find myself thinking more about, hmm, well, another play. Um, because I, I, I really enjoyed writing it. Um, it's a much simpler thing than a novel. Mm. Uh, and, and I like writing dialogue. Uh, so, you know, I just need a new story. And, and it's funny because I do think of <clears throat> the, the limitations of this particular theater. Uh, the, the, you know, you can't fly scenery in, you know, the, you've got to pretty much build a set and work with the set. Now you mm-hmm. can insinuate different places by lighting different, you know, stage left, stage right. Um, but it, it is sort of a, a, a limiting thing in, in, in as much as if, if you're writing a, a screenplay, you can write in all the special effects you want. Mm-hmm. Because they they got computers that'll do that. If you're you know writing for a, a an equity waiver theater with a 200 square foot set where you can't drop anything down from the ceiling or come in, come up from below, you know you, you, there are certain limitations and and uh, th- sort of going back to the the question about the prompt, it, it it's, it's having certain limitations isn't 
necessarily a bad thing. It, it sort of focuses you on what you've got to work with. Like mm -hmm. what's in the refrigerator. I can't cook with what ain't there. Right. For sure. For sure. And, and it allows you again, it, it, it create to me anyway, creates a crucible of sorts. So, yeah. you know, it's what's interesting to me, Bill, what you with what you're talking about, about writing plays. Uh, one of my dear friends from high school is the president of the Dramatist Guild, Andrew Lippa. And he, he said something that I thought was really interesting about the fact that dramatists get to hold on to the copyright, they hold the rights to their plays to their work. And how different is that for you? Actually, now that now that I'm here and thinking of this question, how how does that change your experience of writing the piece if you know that the rights stay with you? Well, I mean, the copyright for all my books were always mine. Um, but the, um, the, the the ability to uh, publish them was limited by the contract. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, uh, eventually Harper Collins would say, okay, you can have the rights back to these two books, but we're keeping these seven. Mm. Um, uh, the, the copyright, you know, is still in my name, mm -hmm. but I can't, um, compete with them because my contract says, you know, <laughs> no, we're, we're the ones selling the books. Right. You can't also be selling the books. Um, so it doesn't it uh, it doesn't really have much impact um, uh, knowing and I don't ha I have no idea if the uh, the altruist for example of w what I am supposed to do with it <laughs> after, after we get it up uh, assuming that it ever gets actually staged fully at the group rep it's like well you know, then what I, I don't know enough about I still don't know enough about the the, the theater market. To say, well, then, you know, because I was looking for agents and they're mm -hmm. really, unless you're, you know, David Mamet or somebody, uh, um, Lin-Manuel Miranda, I don't know that there there aren't really agents for playwrights in the same way that there are agents for TV writers and screenwriters mm -hmm. who then go to the television producers or the film producers and say, I've got this writer uh, who's perfect for your series or who has written this spec script. Um, I've got to find out because I, I you know, I, I know that people have their plays produced all around the country. Sure. Somehow. <laughs> so how do you do that? So I'm, I'll be learning about that. Yeah. There's a whole, they have to pay for the rights and get the scripts and, and all of that part of it that there's it's 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 a different it's a different kettle of corn than well, then there is something called the new play exchange that i was on briefly um npx i think is the abbreviation mm -hmm. um, but i i didn't have you know it didn't do anything for me and maybe i just wasn't working it the way it needs to be worked to, to get people um but maybe you know in the in the course of being at, at the group rep um, I think that we, we do, they, they will do seminars. And I think one that they, they talked about is uh, a, a play marketing person. Mm. So I'll, I'll be attending that one. For oh, sure. There's one, one other thing is um, a, a woman named Ann Ford is uh, in the throes of trying to produce a documentary on uh, the radio station where I worked first, WZZQFM. Um and uh, it, it's it's legendary in its uh, in the South mm -hmm. uh, among people of a certain age. And I had written a, a, a pretty nah, I'd written a magazine article that was published some years ago about the station, and just happened to know a lot of details. So I'm, I'm kind of working on the documentary with her just because I was there. And I had written about it, and I've got a lot of information. So I'm kind of learning also about um, uh, how she's making this documentary film. Wow. And maybe you'll become a documentarian after this, too. Just keep branching out and doing cool things. I'll be a talking head in the documentary. But... <laughs> Yeah, no, but I mean, there's there's already not enough money in playwriting. I don't that's... think that's <laughs> documentary. You know, uh, yeah, puppetry next. <laughs> 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 
mime. You will be a yes, mime. Yes, there's lots of money to be made in the mime. World. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm going to get all these comments from mimes and puppeteers. Yeah. Hey, wait yeah, a minute. They won't, they won't say anything. They won't. <laughs> That's true. I feel better now. Thank blank you for that. Emails, all those mimes. <laughs> the blank emails again. Yes, and and or maybe you know just a wall, a picture of a, a glass wall. Uh, <laughs> so right. I I uh, I I'm as I said earlier, I'm super grateful that you took the time to to chat with me again today. And you know, you probably don't remember, but in case you do, uh, I have that last question that I always ask everybody. Which is, uh, if you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? <laughs> we didn't do that last time, did we? Yes, we did. Really? Yes, what did we I did. Say? I don't remember. <laughs> I'll have to go back and listen. But yes, absolutely, we did. I do this with everybody who comes on the show. You're just uh, stalling, I'm, aren't you? You're going. Wait a minute. Yeah, I have to I'm, think of. <laughs> This is like you get 10 minutes to write a story. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, 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 First thing that buy, comes to your buy mind. Buy the edited organ grind. <laughs> <laughs> Succinct. I like it. <laughs> that was beautiful, Bill. Thank you very much. That's the best I could come up with. Profound. No, no, no. It's, I mean, it, it's absolutely right. You, you're, uh, you know, you're a storyteller and you told a story that you thought you could tell better and you want people to go find that better version of the story. Maybe that makes save them time. <laughs> 20,000 words worth. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I adore you. That's great. Thank you so much again for being on the show, Bill. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast, reminding you that First of all, you're going to need to go out and get all of Bill Fitzhugh's books, obviously. And if you get a chance to see The Altruist when it comes to your town, because I'm sure it's going to get staged lots of different places, you're going to need to see it. It is absurd and macabre and hilarious. So you're going to love it. Until next time, I remind you to be bold, be creative, and be kind. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you.